look for interests. If you don't enjoy anything, that's what life's for. I mean, you're gonna enjoy something if you just try enough things. Is that rock climbing, motocross, Thai boxing? Just start, do things until you find things that you enjoy, and then be a person in that space that asks people questions and listen to the answers. What are some of the most common mistakes that we do in social situations? And if you are not having any friends, is that your fault or is it just bad luck? These are two of the questions that we're going to go into in today's episode. Mm. And that is all that we have planned so far <laughs> and the reason for that is not only because we are lazy it's because today i'm going to explore some of eric's experiences when he was younger and for that to be a real conversation it's important that i don't know things that he will say if we plan it it's going to take the magic a little bit out of it so this would be a spontaneous and hopefully real dig into what Eric's challenges was with finding friends when he was younger and what he learned from it. And the Eric I'm mentioning is uh, the <laughs> founder guy. of Great.com, <laughs> Eric Bergman, a uh, serial entrepreneur, an Instagram Mongol, <laughs> a um, tantric enthusiast, I've heard. <laughs> so many things. <laughs> Thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Uh, I'm excited about this. Yeah. I think it's. I like our spontaneous episodes because they get very real. Yeah, it gets emotional and very deep. And I'm here with Emil, my emotional accountability buddy, who I like to explore communication and humanity with. And he's the host of the Becoming Great dot com podcast. The first one joining me in Great. How are you? I am feeling a bit relieved. We just did an episode where you focused on me and I had to be <laughs> quite exposed. So now I'm happy to return, return the, favor. the favor. I hope you're nervous. I'm nervous as <laughs> You're crap. suggesting this. What is this podcast? Oh, the becominggreat.com podcast. Yes. Yes. Is uh, for anyone who wants to make the world or their own life too, for that matter, better through entrepreneurship and personal development. Yes. Dum, 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 dum. Yes. So let's begin. One of the questions you opened with is um, if you don't have friends, it does, is that kind of your fault? Is it bad luck or is that somehow a skill? So I'm wondering, were you struggling to find friends when you were younger? Yes, yeah, so if we go back to 1998, it's Eric, 10 years old. I barely had any friends at all. I mean, I knew people in school and whatnot, but especially outside of school hours, I was very lonely. There was a silent phone that didn't ring. Uh, I was rarely invited to stuff. And yeah, it just, I never really understood why. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely struggled to find friends. So 10 years old, how did you deal with that? What were the conclusions you were drawing? So I, I blamed it on bad luck at the time. I didn't understand what was going on. I know my brother had struggled with similar things. Uh, he was, yeah, he, he definitely struggled. My older brother, so I, I blamed him to some extent. Like he didn't have friends and that's why I don't have friends. Uh, kind of. And I was also ashamed of it. I don't think I spoke much about it as a problem. I didn't share much about it with my family. Like, I didn't tell my parents I felt lonely. I, yeah, I, I don't think I had a way of dealing with it. I just was. Hmm. I get anxious thinking about that to 
keep it all to yourself and having no one to to talk with. Yeah, well, I mean, ironically, some of the most shameful things in the world are the things that we have very little control over. Like, if you are born with a handicap, it's definitely not your fault, but I can imagine it's something that's being very shameful. The first thing that pops into my head was the... Okay, so in, in my school there was this uh, girl who was born with some kind of an intestine disease. So she had a, I don't know what the word for it is, but when you have a, a bag on your stomach and mm-hmm. you kind of pooping into a bag, mm-hmm. which is never a fun thing, and especially not if you're like a 10, 11 year old mm-hmm. girl. And that was something that everyone made fun of her for. And I'm just assuming that she felt a lot of guilt and shame towards this. And nothing could have been less her fault than that. And even if I wasn't at that extreme, I still felt a lot of shame for not being able to make friends or being somewhat bullied, even though it obviously wasn't my fault. Mm. And I guess that creates some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy and downward spiral. Now you feel less confident and then it might be even harder to find friends. Yeah, probably. I've never thought it that way, but yeah, the the less friends you have, the less you probably like yourself and the harder it is to make friends. Yeah. So fast forward a little bit. Uh, let's say Eric 15, for example. How do you think the traumatic experience of loneliness then affected who you are when you were 15? So when we were... Well, when I was 13, 14, uh, 13, our family moved. So I started a new school and somehow, I don't really know how that happened, I found myself with friends. I started a new class, everyone started, so there was, in Sweden, when you move from 6th to 7th grade, everyone switches schools. Mm -hmm. I just switched to a completely different school than all of the other people who went to my previous school. And somehow I got a lot of friends in that class, and I don't really know how that happened, but I know I felt a desperate need of fitting in, because for the first time in my life I had friends around me. So I was doing everything that I could think of to to fit in, trying my best to be a part of everything. I I can see that I... I try to be funny on other people's expense to kind of lift myself up. I try to be, show how smart I was to kind of show my own value. I spent all the money that I could get my hands off from my family and stuff on like expensive clothes to kind of show that at least I could have these Nike shirts or stuff. Um, so yeah, all kinds of these things that I would do desperately to fit in. Mm. So if you imagine then your... 13 to 15 something and you're in school what did it feel like being inside of your body when you were you know people just hanging out what were you looking for like how did you experience that i think i felt pretty calm most of the time at that age it was more that i felt at least in school in school it felt pretty good outside of school i always felt i had a sense of not really belonging so there was a group of friends uh, that I'd known each other for a very long time. And I always felt that I wanted to be a part of that group. And sometimes I was welcome and sometimes I wasn't. And I never really understood when or why. Or it felt like sometimes when I'm calling, they're picking up. And sometimes I just can't get hold of anyone in that group. Like it felt like they kind of making fun of me behind my back or like deciding, oh, now Eric is calling, let's not pick up. Like Mm. it felt like there was a peer pressure within that group not to accept me. So when I was on -on one-on-one with someone, it felt like I had a belonging. But when I knew that they were together somewhere and I couldn't get hold of anyone, then I felt very left left out, um, confused. Mm. Yeah, lonely, sad. Yes, so many years now, then where you don't understand what is happening. 
yeah, I really didn't understand. I just thought it was bad luck. Is there something that you wish would have been different? So the last couple of years I've been focusing a lot on understanding social skills and understanding social dynamics, why, why some people like other people and why not. And looking back now, I can see that I did a lot of mistakes. I can see that I try to make myself funny on the expense of others. I try to focus a lot on being interesting rather than being interested, which we have spoken about in a previous episode. I try to build myself up instead of showing my genuine interest in others. And I can see that I did so many of these things badly that I today can see why 10, 12-year-old Eric was really struggling to make friends because he was a douche. I mean, he wasn't a good friend in himself. He was trying to, to lift himself up. He was trying to get validation outside all the time. And if I could have changed something, I would have loved to sit down with, with him and kind of guide him through how social wor life works because you don't get to learn that in school. Mm. And it's so unfair, I think, to that Eric that I guess what he takes with him is that I am bad at this. I don't have friends. I don't know how to socialize. And in reality, this was you would have needed someone that you can see now with your adult eyes that I would have needed someone to teach me this skill. Yeah. But you couldn't see it as a skill. You saw it as who you are at that point. So I think as a defense mechanism, I never saw myself as being bad at this. Mm. I, I had a narcissistic approach to this feeling that I was still superior. Mm. I always felt that I was good. I was always felt that I was... Uh, valuable or at least I imagined that I saw that it and would I think be painful to imagine yourself not being valuable exactly so I saw myself as better than other people even though I was lonely and I can see how that was my defense mechanism probably behind those feelings was a feeling of not being good enough not being loved not getting any validation from anywhere mm. but I wasn't in contact with those emotions because I was stuck in thinking that I was better than anyone else mm. What do you think would have happened if you would have come in contact with that then? The first thing that pops into my head is that it would completely beat me down. Mm. That if if 12-year-old Eric would have realized that he was really bad at something, uh, I think <clears throat> he would feel very sad about that. And at the end of that, that might be... I can see how that would be like ripping off a Band-Aid. Mm. That... By not seeing that I was bad, I couldn't see that I could learn it. I'd say that today when I've learned social skills, I didn't learn it because I felt that I was bad at it to start with. I learned it because I kind of stumbled into it. And then I realized that I was bad at it. Mm. I didn't learn it from a feeling of a need of learning it. And it was first when I realized that I sucked at it, I wanted to be better at it. So I think if 12-year-old Eric would have realized you suck at this, he would probably feel really bad for a while, but then he might have realized that this is a skill that you can learn and I would be able to learn it. And it's so hard for him to be able to take in the idea that I might be bad at this if he had no realistic chance or people around him to guide him to how can I improve. Yeah. Very few have that. Yeah, and no one told him as well that it's common to feel this way. Yeah, I think it's super common. I believe that pretty much everyone in their pre-teen and teenage years feels so socially awkward in various ways, feel a big need of changing who they are to fit in. And no one wants to talk about it because obviously everyone wants to fit in and no one else talks about it. So I believe... There were probably at least five more people just in my class alone that spent most of their time feeling lonely. And if someone would have talked about it, we could have been lonely together and mm. no one would have been lonely, but no one talks about it. Mm. Yeah, what to even say to someone? I don't know.
So an idea that we are really try to convey here is that not only is social skills something that you can learn and it's not so hard to learn it as you might think, but also that if you are someone that is struggling with social skills right now, you have probably a much higher potential to be good at it than someone that is naturally okay. Because this feeling of, ah, I'm not good at this, I want to change, that is what can propel you towards a journey of improvement in this skill. So let's jump into what can someone do then to find friends? Do you have some things so, that you would like to teach maybe your older self? Yeah, so I think that the first thing I would do is to read the book How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, which is just filled with a lot of small tips and tricks uh, that you can do. And I'm happy to touch on, on some of them. And I would also just put myself in a lot of social situations. Um, like create, get interests and be around people with interests. And if you're in a football team and everyone else is playing football, you're immediately around a lot of people doing something they enjoy. If you start dancing, you're going to be around people who are dancing. Or if you do theater class, all of these are tricky things to do and can be challenging, but you're meeting people who are doing something they enjoy doing. So one side of this is make sure to be in social situations. Because if you're isolating yourself, thinking I suck at social skills, you're never getting anywhere. So you could do this by going up to strangers in a nightclub, and or you can do this by being in a theater class. It doesn't really matter, but at least that you need to get to a certain point of interactions. And... I believe the key is what we touched upon with the episode that we did previously with you and that I touched upon here, that it's so important to be interested. That if there is one thing that you take away from this episode, learn to be interested. Learn to ask questions, looking to hear the answers. Listen more than you talk, because that's a big mistake that I did. I talked five times as much as I listened, ten times more as, as much as I listened. And it's quite annoying to be around someone who just talks and never listens because at the end of the day we want to share our perspectives and I went to the extent that I got the nickname radio at one time which is like that's just not a fun nickname to have mm. because I was talking so much so putting myself in situations where I'm around people and learning how to listen but also how to ask questions because if you're not having many friends you might end up being the very silent person and that's just not a good thing to be either because no one notices the silent person. You want to be engaging with questions. Mm. Be genuinely interested. What are people caring about? And look for what they enjoy in life. Not necessarily what are you working with, but what, what makes you happy? What gives you energy? What are your genuine interests? What's your dog's name? Mm. People, things that people care about. So what if someone reacts when you say go to this class or go to these social gatherings and someone says, I don't like being in those places. I don't have fun socializing. I just want to go home. I think that it's a very common way to feel. And I think that goes with social awkwardness. That it's a skill. To learn to be around people, to learn to find friends is a skill. And if you don't like being there simply for the fact that you really don't like theater or really don't like football or dance, then that's one thing. If you don't want to be there because it's painful to be there, then I would consider staying anyway because you're learning. I think being in, in pain or being in a state of frustration I believe it's often the feeling of learning. Yeah. And the pain or the frustration is actually you learning something. It's new things happening in your brain, new things happening in your body, and they're painful. Your body wants to chill. It wants to stay on the couch. 
it doesn't want to put you in awkward situation that's scary that's not what our body is for so we need to make an effort to do that and if you find dancing football and theater boring but you still want to make friends try other things try a chess club try i don't know group sudoku try public speaking pick up an instrument look for interests because if you don't enjoy anything that's what life's for i mean you're gonna enjoy something if you just try enough thing is that rock climbing motocross thai boxing just start do things until you find things that you enjoy and then be a person in that space that asks people questions and listen to the answers i can imagine someone that finds social situations tricky that they're often at least i was experiencing this i was having a difficulty coming up with something to say even having difficulties coming up with questions to ask. So do you have some questions that you think could be good openers to at least make the beginning of interactions okay? So one question that I like, uh, I mean, the most common ones are like, what are you working with? What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. One question I really like is what makes you excited? What are you exciting, excited about in your life right now? And what's good with that question is that you're immediately going for a strong emotion. That if I'm asking you, what are you excited about? It's going to put you in a place where you talk about what you're most excited about, which is probably what is easiest for you to talk about. So if I ask you right now, what are you excited about? Knowing you, I'm pretty sure that you would either start talking about this podcast in the podcast studio and you would just go ramping (laughs) on and talk forever or your dog, Oscar, and you would talk a lot about Oscar. Mm. Or you would talk about Photoshop that you're learning right now. And it would turn the conversation, it would likely be fairly easy because I could just keep asking questions about, okay, so what is it about your dog that makes you so happy? Or look for emotional positive words, like excited, happy, and things like that. And you can steer conversations around those. And I think two things you said now is so crucial. You said you can keep asking questions and you can steer the conversation. Yeah. Could you explain why that is important? Sure. So if you keep asking questions, you keep showing interest. Yeah. And the opposite is also true. Yeah. So if if you stop asking questions, basically, if I'm asking you, what are you excited about? I'm really excited about... uh, Photoshop now and camera tech in general. Yeah, I don't care about Photoshop, but I do have a cat. <laughs> even if you don't say that, even if you say, oh, even if you just ask another question, like, okay, so what did you do last weekend? Then I assume that you don't care about the thing I care about the most. Exactly. And then we're not friends. No, because then we have nothing in common. Yeah. But if I keep asking, okay, so what is it about Photoshop that you enjoy so much? Yeah. Then I feel so seen and excited. (laughs) And you don't have to be interested in Photoshop to be interested in why I am interested in Photoshop. Exactly. And I can go for those emotional things. Yeah. Because you feel the feeling of excitement. I feel the feeling of excitement. Both of them are the same in us. Yeah. I might get it from podcasting. You might get it from Photoshop. But to get the understanding, what is the creative thing about it? What's... What is it that you enjoy about doing something? Or how will you use this in your career or whatever? Mm. There will always be ways to go there. And if someone is talking from a feeling of excitement and you can keep that, I mean, you can use this in the other way as well. If if you, if we had a deeper connection and we maybe was in a deep, different emotional state, I guess, what are you worried about right now? Because yeah. you might look concerned or what are you sad about or whatnot? One thing that I think is an important key concept, if you are feeling nervous, you don't feel like you have something to say, what my approach was when I was feeling that way was to hide that as much as possible. My my hope was that no one would ever see that I'm uncomfortable <laughs> socially. And to this day, I imagine that the complete opposite is true. If you are nervous around people, say, hey, I'm feeling nervous talking with you right now. Because I feel a little bit socially awkward. I think that's just going to blow up so many conversations. Blow up, like open up, not blow up. Yeah, because that can lead to a lot of... I I can imagine that's a very scary thing to say. Yeah. 
and I can still feel if someone said that to me, okay, so I'm just guessing here. In, in a lot of social interactions, there are two nervous people talking to each other. Yeah. And if one person says that they're nervous, yeah. immediately the other person is going to be less nervous. Yeah. Is what I'm guessing. Yeah. And that way, oh, why are you nervous? Or, yeah. oh, that's, I was also nervous. Yeah. And you're feeling the same thing. And that connection and feeling that same thing, that is building a friendship. I like that. I've never tried it, but I can say... Do try this at home. <laughs> I like that. I've never said that. Uh, but yeah, I think that's really true. So go for the excitement and try to be real. Yeah. Don't try to be something you're not. Because the more genuine you are, the less you're trying to fake, the easier things are. Because yeah. it's really hard when you start changing something or trying to hide something or lying. Because you need to keep track of everything. Yeah. But if you're just you, then you're just you. Yeah. If you are listening to this, you like this type of conversations, you like the way we speak about personal development and the things we want to share, and you maybe want to help us out a little bit, what you can do is that you can go into your podcast app and press subscribe. And that really helps us out because we're a tiny, tiny, tiny little podcast. But if you get into podcast top lists or not, it has to do with how many subscribers do you have in comparison to your viewers. So that means we can still get into the podcast apps and then many more can hear these conversations. And wouldn't that be super duper cool, eh? Because then we want to do more conversations. Then we want to do you more get to conversations. listen to more of our exactly. humble and brilliant and super smart things we say. They are indeed <laughs> humble and super smart. So uh, thanks thank for today. you. See you next week. Yeah, and thank you for sharing things that I guess... Is vulnerable and takes energy to go back and retrieve for the benefit of me and anyone listening. So thank you. Thank you. See you next week. See you.